morning, everyone, and welcome to Project Insights Agile Practice Webinar. The topic for today, Retrospective Techniques and Nonviolent Communication. Just a few things to note before we get started. All participants will be put on mute. However, any questions you have are more than welcome. Please go ahead and type those questions into your question box, which you can find on your GoToWebinar dashboard. We'll try to answer all of your questions during the session, but if we can't, we'll make sure to get to you through email. Please note that all of our PM training sessions and Agile sessions are valid for one PDE free of charge. However, you must be in attendance for the full session. I will email you your certificate by the end of today, so please hold off on emailing me about your certificate until then. For all other PDE information, please visit our PI community, type in PDE in the search, and you will find your PMI rules in an article called Webinars and PDUs. Also, please note that this webinar recording and slides will be available within our Project Insight community. And for those interested in um, reviewing it later, that recording and slides will also be sent to you via email by tomorrow. My name is Denise and I will be your moderator for today. I'm on the marketing team here at Project Insight. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, uh, anything else I can help you with, please feel free to reach me at denise.rodriguez at projectinsight.com. If you're not already familiar with Project Insight, we're a cloud-based project management solution. We work with two kinds of companies, those that are rapidly growing and need to scale the way they're managing their projects, and those who want greater visibility across their project portfolio, want more insights into the workloads of their resources, and want a better way to collaborate on projects among team members. If any of these sound familiar to you and you would like to learn more, please feel free to contact us via phone email, or of course you can always request your free demo at projectinsight.net. We'd like to give a warm welcome to our presenter today, Dr. Dave Cornelius. Uh, Dr. Dave is an experienced IT and business professional and a globally recognized lean and agile catalyst who empowers others to achieve their very best. He specializes in coaching, training, and leading leading co-located and distributed teams to deliver quality innovations from concept to cash. Dave has also held several leadership roles where he has helped transform IT into a partner with other groups within the organization. He is also the founder of the Five Saturdays program and leads the group's leadership council. Good morning, Dave. How are you doing today? Thank you so much for joining us. I am having an amazing day. How about you, Denise? I'm having a fabulous day. Thank you for asking. Wonderful. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I have something that's a bit different and, and interesting in terms of our presentation today. Um, so we're going to talk, as usual, we always begin on the webinar by answering questions from the previous event. Oh, so the last time was October 20th. And just to remind everyone, um, this will be the final Agile webinar for 2016, and we'll begin again in 2017. So these are the, the questions that certain people have. So Sanjay wanted to know, um, what if two weeks' cadence is not long enough to produce something meaningful? Um, I think it's really simple that we continue to look at the acceptance criteria and do some discovery after our two-week sprints and see how we could improve the next um, two weeks. Um, I, I think that since everything is incremental, we, there shouldn't be an expectation of having the answers always all at the same time sometimes. Um, it, it may take several sprints for you to get the full, you know, Monty uh, of information that's needed. So I said rinse and repeat until you improve. Um, to achieve the acceptance criteria. So Bruce asks, uh, is there a benefit to mixing up the micro teams over, over a period of time, uh, even when time zones are not a problem, um, or changing players across micro teams? And the concept of micro teams is having three to five uh, team members per team. And essentially, the, the, the conversation at the last time was that, you know, we should re-team 
and really move players around so they do not become stagnant. But I think it's really critical that we continue to engage the different members of our teams and, and give them something new, give them a new challenge, sometimes even to share the knowledge of if you have super experienced people who are all on the same team, I think it's important to continue to move them around and so that they may also um, learn from others. And so, you know, no more complacency, encourage people to uh, learn how to work with others. So th those are the two questions that were selected. Um, please feel free to submit more. Um, I'll be happy to respond to um, your questions. So today we're going to talk about retrospectives and nonviolent communication. And so key topics, nonviolent communication and retrospective techniques. I think retrospectives are really important really important for our lives and really important for how we work and really get in the, in the context of continual learning. And so at the end of this presentation, um, we want to make sure that you understand the power of using retrospectives to continually learn, uh, demonstrate empathy through the practice of NVC, which is nonviolent communication, um, use compassionate language to resolve conflict, identify areas to build stronger and stable teams, and help teams learn how to self-organize and resolve conflicts. Um, I, I believe that everyone has the ability, ability to lead and we should all create an environment, an encouraging environment to get work done. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to read before I start is um, something by Marshall Rosenberg, PhD. He, he is the founder of Nonviolent Communication and this is just a short thing that he wrote. Um, is it, it's called Giving from the Heart, the Heart of Nonviolent Communication. And he said, what I want in life is compassion, a flow between myself and others based on a mutual giving from the heart. And so that's the foundation for nonviolent communication. And I want to begin there in our discussion today. So when we think of NVC, you know, I said there's four key components. Well, I didn't say that. Um, Marshall did. Marshall Rosenberg um, said that there were four components to, to NVC. And those four components are basically it begins with the, the context of observing. But to, before I start there, I said NVC and its objective is really building a relationship based on honesty and empathy. And so the four components that I refer to are, are things like observing, you know, so we begin to sense what's going on around us, we begin to observe what's going on with people, um, what's going on in our environment, feeling, you know, listening to our inner feelings about what people are experiencing, what we are experiencing when we engage other people, needing, you know, we, I think it's important that oftentimes when we're in a team setting, that we take a, a step back and we do not express exactly what our needs are. And so NVC helps us to recognize that it is important to express our needs and share that with others in the team. Otherwise, well, they would never know, right? And I also request them, and we look at actions to enrich our lives, that not only do we know what is needed, but it's important for us to go and to request to other people and say, hey, I need this from you. Um, or oh, I need something like that. So let's dig in to each one of those four components. And we, we will begin with evaluating without, I mean, observing without evaluating. And, and sometimes this is really hard to do. And the, the term evaluating here is real, really pertains to judgment. Uh, and so we begin by, you know, we, we sense what is seen, heard, and touch, and really things that are really affecting our well-being. And, and so that's mean that we're more in tune with our environment and we're more in tune with who we are also. And we're just really getting in touch with all of our senses at that point in time. And as we go through and we begin to observe other people, and I, I have this as a bad habit, you know, sometimes you look at someone and I begin to evaluate those individuals right away based on my own context and and, it, and it's hard to do so it's one of those things that you have to be very intentional about um, in terms of how, who we observe and how we observe 
uh, people to, to ensure that we're observing and our evaluation is just based on honesty and really empathy. But as we go through the, the whole point of looking at understanding that when we build observation and evaluation, um, it leads to criticism. And they could be silent crit criticism. And silent criticism often change how we experience others and how we respond, um, how we respond to those people. So I also think that when, as we observe people and their behavior, sometimes it's really difficult to do without criticism. I, I know certainly that I have that experience and it's something that I have to be very uh, careful with, especially while, while I'm coaching, because sometimes you may see someone in, in, in an, a setting and some of their behavior may not actually sit well with who you are and the things that you believe, but as a coach and someone who is leading, um, you have to get into a position to where like, okay, I, I, let me start to sense exactly what's going on with this person and how do I observe them and, and really not criticize them and really not have complete negative feelings to who they are and what their needs are. The second aspect of things is that we are identifying and expressing feelings. And so feelings, as we look at them, that they can be strong and passionate. And as an example, you know, I feel encouraged and energetic. Uh, and that's something that really could resonate, resonate with someone. Um, we could be delicate and sensitive. And it's hard to tell people that you're, you're vulnerable or you're having some form of affection toward, not them per, per se, but some affection toward the work that you're doing or, or the way you guys, the way you are interacting with those individuals. So, I mean, in, in terms of how we express, we could be delicate and we could be um, sensitive as well. But fear and loathing, I mean, this is common. And uh, this is something that happens when we're in new teens and we meet new people in new settings that you could say, I feel afraid or, or this is, you know, I, I'm, this is, I feel that things are really horrible at this point in time. But we have to also understand exactly why we feel that way and how can we do something about it. Anger and confusion. And, and this happens, like I said, when you change new teams and, and you're in a different setting. Um, you have a new leader in your organization. Um, you could feel frustrated and helpless. And I think it's essential as we're in an organization or in any space that we begin to identify and express our feelings um, immensely because one of the things in, in our society, and if you're a guy, especially if you're a guy, um, we've been taught from the beginning that we shouldn't express our feelings. And we keep those things bottled up, and then until one day we become this roaring monster, you know, really angry at everything around us. I think it's, it's important that we understand that, that we express our feelings. The, the, the third is really expressing needs. And one of the things that we get with the, the, the ability to express needs is that, you know, there's a certain amount of autonomy to choose what we want to dream, our goals and our values. Um, living in the U.S., um, that's certainly one of the things that we get as, as part of the, the great deal of, of being uh, living here in, in the United States. But I think it's also important wherever you are to be able to have that the autonomy to choose what dreams that you have as you participate in a team, what goals and values. And then there has to be some alignment, alignment as well. Um, we also, if you look at how we contribute to enrich others' lives, um, it shouldn't just be about ourselves, but the needs that we have should also take into consideration the people around us and the impact that that could have on those individuals. I think that this will help us to achieve this great emotional liberation of not really carrying the burden or hide, hiding things within ourselves because there's fear and we're afraid of being load, loaded by someone else. So I want you to say that there's a great caution that we want to take a look at. Um, do, you know, most of us, this, once we get this freedom that we think that, now I could express my, my needs at any point in time, sometimes we need to take a, a break and stop and say, you know what, 
I shouldn't do this at the expense of others. I need to make sure that this also includes other people or, or considers other people in what they're expressing. Um, and then the fourth is, is requesting, but it's requesting to enrich um, your life. And, and so the way we get there is that we use positive action language. Um, it, so essentially, if you're setting up a room of some sort, you're doing a presentation or you're having a meeting, um, you could ask someone very something simple as, you know, would you help with setting up the room? And I know that that may seem really simplistic, but one, one, one thing that you, you would do is that you just relieved yourself of one less thing to do. But you also built a relationship of trust. You're beginning to do that with someone else in the room by giving them a responsibility and some level of accountability. We have to be clear about what we want. Um, and sometimes we're not very clear about what we want. We say things that, you know, based on our language, that, that may mean different things. So here's an ex example. It's like, please remove the posters from the, the, the right wall. And so if you're in a room and that person is facing you, um, you have to make sure that you tell them which wall is right, if, if you're stage, stage right or, or, or not, so that they could have a much better understanding. And, and so we have to be clear about what we really want and, and we're requesting. Uh, we have to request with empathy. And, and an example is that at times I, I feel I am, bur I am a burden. You know, can you help me run this meeting? So that's really empathetic in, in terms of, hey, this is how I'm feeling right now. And, and I really don't want to burden you, but I need your help. Right? And so you express this in a very empathetic way that people could really connect with and understand. I, I said, be aware of, of our objective based on honesty and empathy. And a, it's an example of that is like solving this problem is important for the company's growth. And so we are empathetic to the organization. We're empathetic to the other person because maybe they could relate to us contextually. And I think that is very important in terms of how we um, express ourselves. So now I have just talked about the four components of MVC. Let me see if you were paying attention or not. And let's just check in and see what our first um, group engagement. So for our first group engagement, they said, please select the NVC, one of the, um, the four, please select the NVC four components. And so is it A, observing, feeling, needing, and requesting, B, observing, giving, needing, and asking, C, requesting, observing, feelings, and knowing, or D, feeling, needing, requesting, and leaving. So Denise, let's see exactly what our pollers have to say. I know it's, it's really important that we dig in and, and start to think about how we're going to observe without criticism or, or, or also how we're going to express our feelings or our needs and, and how we're going to request things from other people. Uh, I think those things are so critical in terms of how we interact with each other. So how, how are we doing, Denise? Um, how are people responding to you? Share some of our results. Okay, so 63% said A, 23% said B, 12% uh, voted for C, and 2% voted for D. That's the correct answer. Well, the correct answer is A. I think people are paying attention. At least most of us are. I've had a coffee this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in. Okay. So let's move along, and we're going to talk about, now we're going to get into retrospective, which is a key practice. So Agile has roughly about 15 principles, and one important principle is, is principle number 12. And it states that at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. And I, I I think this is important for us to, to dissect a little bit that 
at regular intervals. So when we think of regular intervals in the Agile space, we're thinking of sprints. And so at the end of a sprint, which is normally two weeks, the, the team take a step back and says, we're going to meet for 90 minutes to um, 120 minutes or two hours, you know, one and a half to two hours, and sit down and begin to reflect and how do we become more effective? You know, how do we tune our behaviors and adjust so that we could be a bit more effective and efficient in the process? And people will sit and ask basic questions, um, you know, what went well? What did not go well? Uh, how would we improve and, and do things differently the next time? So we're asking those critical questions of ourselves and everyone by applying NBC con concepts, um, there's a certain amount of, of observation that we've made over two weeks. And we want to do that without being critical, but being honest and do it in an empathetic way. There are feelings and needs that, that may, have come up, come, may have come up in that two weeks that we have the ability to express that. I think it's important that we do that. And, and also it's just requesting things of, you know, what, what could we change and make better? But to run a retrospective, the stuff that we need, um, I said we need uh, some post-it notepads. Um, we have these large post-it easel pads, really big pieces of paper that we could stick to the wall. And we needed like Sharpies or pens uh, or coloring pencils. Uh, we use painter's tape a lot, the blue painter's tape. Um, it could be butcher tape, anything thing that sticks to the wall without destroying the wall. And the mostly important thing that sometimes we miss is that, yeah, we need space. We need a wall with some space. So the goals of a retrospective is really to get us to a point, is to get into continual learning. And it's a great tool for doing that. Every two weeks, we're continually identifying how do we get better and how do we improve. Um, we, look at the, we look at the past, and so we can learn fast. We look at the past so we can learn fast. We retrospect, look, look back. Um, we expressed as a desire to learn and improve always. And what's really fun about retrospective is that we use improv and games to really engage the teams. So it's not this boring drop thing that we, we sit down and, and do nothing. So when we do retrospective, there's really five different steps or five stages that we engage. The first thing that we engage in is setting the stage. Because um, basically, lots of times, people come into a retrospective sometimes after having a really tough experience. And the, the first thing you want to do is to make sure that the stage is set where our minds are in the right place. So one, the first thing we want to do is to give space to make sure that people could describe their experience and it's very personal and it's as a team. And also the team, um, what was the most recent that's really important? And so here's a simple series of steps that you would use to go about executing a retrospective. And, and you know, before I go any further, I should give credit to the people who um, came up with these five steps. Um, and it's, it's, her name is Dinah Larson, is, is one of the author. And um, oh, why am I spacing on the second author? I just saw her a few months ago. Um, and when it comes back to me, I'll share that. But they wrote this book called Advanced Retrospective Techniques. And in that book, these five steps were outlined. And a lot of people in the Agile space continue to use these, these principles and techniques and stages to execute a retrospective. So I just wanted to make sure that we, I, we, I gave attribution um, to Dana Larson. And oh gosh, I, anyway, it'll, it'll come to me. Sorry about that. So here's how we execute. And so oftentimes, for me, so things are not really boring, I have at least four set the stage activities to keep things fresh. Um, and so you would select one per sprint. So if you have four, you know, if a sprint is two weeks, so every two months, I mean, by the third month, you're always recycling. So over four months, you would have four different techniques to, to get things done. Um, we have to create a time box for this thing for about 10 to 15 minutes. You'll, if, as you start getting into practicing Agile, you'll begin to understand that everything is time box because we want to make sure that we have enough uh, what I call um, autonomy boundaries that 
once we get to that boundary of 15 minutes, we said, okay, we need to stop and move on to something, uh, something else. Um, every team will document his or her experience. Um, every member, team member, talks about his or her experience. And really the scrum master, which is a very critical role, and I think I've spoken about this role in, in the past, where they capture those areas to improve and, and really get into continual learning. So here's an example of set the stage. And it's called a weather report. And the weather report is really simple. Um, if you notice this is a big piece of paper right here, and it has project weather. And you have, the, actually there's three columns, so one of them is name, the other one is report, and the one that's not here is called forecast. And as you could know, as, as you would note, that there's people could draw their experience, people could write out their experience, and so that's all part of engaging and using improv as a context. Um, we use weather met metaphors to indicate the experience of that current sprint, and also the prediction for the next sort of forecast. So, as you could see, June, you know, has a sunny, dry, humid. And, and that's the way she's expressing her experience with the previous sprint. You know, her forecast could also be that for the next sprint, it's going to be sunny as well. But also you could see that um, Alan had some a marine layer. It could be that he had a really difficult time trying to get work done. And, and what the reason that this is important, um, you would begin to see that people are are lightening up, Pe people are, are beginning to loosen up a bit, and they're not as tense as they normally would be if you were having a status meeting. So just setting the stage is just really important for, as a scrum master, as a leader, for everyone in the room to get a context and go like, wow, why was Alan having such a marine, uh, having such a tough time, you know, what, what, what was it, um, and how could we help Alan? Right, and so empathy begins to come into the way we think about our teammates and our team members. Uh, sec the, the second step, which is also important, is to gather data. So these, the, the data could be subjective or objective. Um, it based on, you know, what do we see, hear, feel, and how to respond. And you can see how we're beginning to tie this back in with NVC in terms of our expressing um, our observation. Um, we can use qualitative or quantitative um, ways to look at information because we may have we may have a, a graph of how we c completed work over the two weeks. You know, one of the interesting things that happens in lots of agile teams is that you have ten days in a sprint, and you would see from day one through probably day eight nothing is done and then all of a sudden you have a cliff. Well, what that's telling us is that, you know, we're not breaking work down small enough that we're getting things done throughout the sprint. So, you know, normally you would look, pick up on that and say, well, you know, we need to figure out how we could start getting things done on day two, day three, four, five, six, that we're constantly doing incremental work as we go through. And so let's just see, how do we execute this to gather data? Um, so another t time box of 10 to 15 minutes, um, we draw some illustration in a large post-it easel. Um, we put it on the wall, uh, uh, those big, big pieces of paper, and you'll see. Uh, people would write about their experiences, whether it's positive. They talk about what, things that are challenging, that, that's really impacting them. Um, they put them, those posted on, on the sheets and on, on the wall. People start having open discussion. When the, and, and also the, the Scrum Master also captures the, the, the areas to improve and continue. Um, oh, I just remember her name. Sorry about that. Her name is Esther Derby. Yes, it's Diana Larson and Esther Derby who wrote the book on advanced um, retrospective techniques. Sorry about that, Esther. Uh, so let's look at, at how we, what techniques we could use for step two to gather data. Now, I really enjoy this practice of circles and soup. I think a lot of people that um, I have done this retrospective technique with, they really enjoyed it a lot because the thing is, we get to talk about influence and control, 
you know, what, what our circles are. Soup is things that we have zero control over, and, you know, it's like going to a soup shop, but we have no idea what's in the soup, but we know there's soup. Uh, and so when the, the scrum teams or the, the agile team begin to express the sprint ex experience in, in, the, in the following way. So we said, what are the things, you know, the first circle, you know, what do we have control over? Things that we are be completely responsible for. What are the things that we have influence over, which we are more accountable? Or there's just these external factors that are out of our control, which is just a suit. Um, I use this also. I use this technique also in the context of when I'm doing root cause analysis, as opposed to beating people down. I said, let's talk about circles and suit, so people could begin to understand their part in the pro in the process, their contribution, things that are outside of, of of the scope of their control, because there's nothing we could do. Um, you know, the, the 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 executive suite decide to you know, do a merger and, and acquire um, another company or, or the company is being acquired, to me, that's a suit. There's nothing I could do about that. But in terms of the work that I'm doing, I could control that. People who are contributing to the work that I am doing, I could influence that. So there's just simple ways that we could sit down and begin to have dialogue as a team that is really non-threatening and people could have open conversation. Um, let's move on to ah, another engagement. Let's see exactly um, if you guys have been paying attention to um, the, the two uh, elements of work that we've been talking about. So group engagement number two, circles and soup, help teams understand. A, influence. B, control. C, no influence. D, no control. Or E, all of the above. What do you guys think? Let's see if, if you guys are paying attention or not. So I just want to share also in terms of using circles and soup as a, a tool for understanding, um, let's say if the teams are having a really difficult sprint and there's lots of finger pointing, we don't know, uh, it's Bobby's fault or Sarah's fault or it's that other team's fault, um, we could start to take this technique and start to sit, let, let's sit down and have a discussion, a dialogue around what are the things that are within our control that we could we could really make a difference with? What are the things that we could influence? And what are the things that are just way outside of our control? There's nothing we could do, and we could begin to have that dialogue as a team without without it just being total noise. And in this way, we begin to collect data, and people begin to, can begin to go on to the next step to figure out about oh how do I generate insights based on that data? So how are we doing, Denise? All right, guys, let's see what we got here and share some of our results. 29% said A, influence, 12% said B, control, um, no Cs, and 3% said D, no control, and 56% said all of the above. Uh, well, you guys have been paying attention, at least half of you have been, had your coffee today, so it's all of the above, yes. All of the above, it really helps us to um, understand influence, control, no influence, and no control. And the no influence and no control pertains to the soup. The other circles are control and influence. And so let's keep going. The third step is to generate insights. There's, there's nothing like getting a deeper understanding of all of the different things that people have contributed to this whole continual improvement activity. And it's really simple. And uh, when we get into generating insight, you know, we have to develop a, a problem statement. And so we may begin from all of the data that we have out in that piece of sheet, the stickies, we got in and we said, well, let's start grouping things together to see what are similar. And that's called affinity grouping. And so each team member would create, would build, build, draw a circle around the, the, the group of sticky um, notes. And we said, well, let's call this, um, Team planning, you know, that's one of the, the great themes that we want to look at. Or it could be um, too many defects. So we may have that theme called too many defects. And so that will help us as, as to be an input into what we define a problem statement. And I'll give you an example shortly. 
Um, so we, we may want to execute the five whys by asking why, 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 and giving an answer for each one of those whys. And then the third is we, we have to have a resolution to do the problem statement. It should not linger, um, and we have to really be intentional in, in really trying to find a way of, of how we resolve any issues that we have identified. So generate insights five whys. And so here is something that happens a lot, um, maybe not 80%, but you know, and that's really a truly dysfunctional team that every sprint, 80% of your work you know, goes out the door or it's not completed. So we said that the problem statement that we just, this, and this is actually a, a real um, problem statement of, of working with some teams in the past that you know, closing 80% of, of um, stories at the end of the sprint sprint encourages spillover. Well, you remember I was talking about that cliff where day one through day eight there's nothing and then all of a sudden in nine and ten there's this cliff that happens, all of the work comes in. So the observation from the teams is that, oh yeah, this is not good. We, we discovered and created a problem statement that says 80 percent of the time this is what happens and this really helps to encourage spillover, which means it's work that you're going to go from sprint one to sprint two and potentially from sprint two to sprint three, which is not a good thing because the team made a commitment to get that work done. Um, so here's an example um, of the first why. We would ask, you know, why would closing 80% of stories at the end of sprint of every sprint cause spillover? So the answer, because the one of the things is that the team may say is because the story takes longer than anticipated. And then the next question would be, why, why would um, a story take longer to complete? Um, well, maybe because there's unknown complexity of the story. The third one, well, why is the complexity un unknown? He says, so the answer is the spike, which is a prototype, um, does not provide enough learning that considers legacy code or unknowns risk. The fourth is, is that why is, the, why is the spike not providing enough learning? And the answer could be um, there's that it wasn't thorough enough. Um, Splits not done when new discoveries are needed. And what it means by splits is that we had this big spike, this prototype, this proof of concept, and we, we were attempting to get this done in two weeks. And we should have looked at this and go, God, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, this is too big. Let's split this story into something smaller where we said, I think after we do a bit more analysis that maybe we could, if we do half of this now and take the other piece and be intentional about it and move that out to the, the upcoming sprint, at least we have an opportunity of getting some learning and understanding. So that's what that is really um, referring to. And then we're saying that the feature definition of, of ready is not well defined. So um, you know that's also critically important as well. And the last thing is, is that, yes, we did a stop. We said, you know what, I think we know enough. And we know enough after asking four whys what's going on with our system. Um, and so the plan resolution that we may come up with uh, uh, with the team is that, you know, split stories when new discoveries are made. You know, train the scrum master and the design build test team on story splitting techniques. So as you can see, there's clear insights as to what the problem statement is, um, what the whys are, and there's a plan resolution of how to move forward. Um, so with that, we move on to step four, so that we decide what to do. You know, what are we going to do about this? And so some people may say, so what, now what? So what that we, we know what the problem and a resolution, so now what are we going to do? Um, and so we want to make sure that there's a, 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 a convergence to influence, sustain learning and improvements. And the convergence is of the team coming together, working together, trying to dis discover what to do and make sure that we can use this to, for learning and improvements. Um, one way we get there is doing it through a democratic way of um, doing a fist of five voting. We could also, on fist of five, you know, we go one, two, three, and we only have five fingers, so five is the most, one is the least, and we take the sum of those voting of the things that we want to do. Uh, we could also do Roman voting, which is thumbs up, thumbs down. 
Um, the most popular that everyone use is dot voting. Um, you get a pen, and every person who is on the team, they receive roughly about three votes. And so you could apply those three votes, those three dots, to any of the, the, the themes or ideas that we have um, laid out coming out of, of, um, uh, of our session of, of gathering data. And so how do we execute that? Always time boxed for 10 minutes. Um, we talked about grouping common things that may have come out to form a theme. Um, we have a discussion with the team for agreement. We select one of the, um, the, the voting methods described above, select the theme with the most votes, and only one improvement should be selected per sprint. I, I, I have a, a, a rule with that that we should limit the amount of things that we do always to ensure that um, we're not overwhelmed. And so that is very important. And now step five, we want to close the retrospective. And the way we close the retrospective, we have the context of plan, do, check, act. I always replace the word check and act to inspect and adapt for, for when I'm doing agile um, context. And the way we, we do that is like, so we plan, we create a story for the next, um, the next sprint, right? This is work that we're going to do as a team to make sure that whatever we identified that needed improvement and we had some learning that we're going to make sure that we execute that right away. Um, we communicate the expectation with the team so that we could have an agreement and everyone said, yes, we're going to do this. All right. Um, third, we want to validate if the team is working on that improvement throughout the sprint. So it's front and center. Um, we said we're going to split stories, so we should split stories when they become um, too large, too complex, too much risk. At least we could start taking actions immediately. immediately. And then we want to act, um, close the story at the next, next retrospective if completed. Um, if the story is not closed, then we need to, as a team, get some consensus or agreement um, to if we want to keep it or stop. Right? And so th those are the contexts of really running a retrospective. Five steps that we begin by engaging the team and we also close the retrospective. Uh, let's talk about ah another group engagement. So let's ask the plan, do, check, act, circle of learning help teams improve. Is that true or false? Let's see what you have to say. And if we just imagine, uh, this is going through the context of, uh, of of looking at the work that we're working on, that we're planning, we're doing, we're checking. Uh, we're acting or we're inspecting, we're, we're adapting, it does give us a, uh, an opportunity to figure out how do we do things better if, if necessary. So let's see what you have to say about this. All right, guys, let's check out our results. Ah. Oh. 98% said true and 2% said false. Ah, I think we're paying attention. Ah, good. Yes, it is true. Thank you so much. So let's move on. Um, the next thing is I want to look at how do we really apply MVC in, into our retrospective techniques. And this really speaks to, you know, how are we expressing ourselves? How are, how are we observing? Um, and feelings and requesting. And we use these things called GROK cards. It's G-R-O-K cards. Um, and the whole point of it is for us to start reflecting on our feelings and our experience experiences to the, the group. So let's just, um, if we had a table or circle, you could put them on the floor on a table. Um, this is how we could use this. So here's the situation. We just had a difficult sprint, and a difficult sprint, maybe the teams were not getting along. Um, maybe uh, the work that we did, what we committed to, we could not deliver. Uh, maybe there was external factors that were just disrupting the team. And so we want to like reflect back on that experience and figure out how do we get better at, at, at handling these situations. So the, the approach would, we'll take the deck of cards and We'll spread them all across the table, right, and then have them out there. 
And we'll ask each member of the team to pick one or two cards that reflect an emotion during the sprint. Right? So people could see exactly. So one of, uh, we have an example here that says that encourage. And then so we'll ask each team member to show their card and tell the story of their sprint experience. And, and, and so it's important for people to start to reflect in and, and, and really begin to understand exactly what, what, their, you know, what the experience was so that they could share that back with others so that people may have empathy and, and have some honesty in, in terms of how to respond with that. Um, so as a facilitator, which would be you or I, um, we would listen to, to each person share with empathy uh, we acknowledge what is being said. Um, we also need to think about, you know, what are the needs? Based on what they just said, what are the needs based on the story just told? You know, sometimes it would be amazing that as a facilitator, as you begin to listen more and really be empathetic to the needs of what those individuals are saying, um, it would give us a, a great context of what they really need. So we want to end the period of harvesting and by asking people, like, you know, how was the process for you? Um, you know, do you notice a difference in how you're feeling right now after expressing your experiences? And I know it sounds like a therapy session, but, you know, we need to be able to express where we are and, and, and the things that we're, we're going through so that uh, people would know. And I think it's really important for us to understand that. Ah, so... In summary, as we come to the, uh, a close of this presentation, uh, I can tell you that NDC helps us establish relationships based on honesty and empathy. And the four components that we care about from NDC that, well, it's the key components in NDC, is that we're focused on observing, feeling, needing, and requesting. Um, when we leverage retrospective, it gives us a, an, an opportunity for continual learning and improvements. And teens, you know, can have this great experience of psychological safety, and they could share openly. Um, so you could see how, as a team, you could start to build trust immediately to deal with really difficult things. And now once trust is established, you know, collaboration is much easier for people to really get out and, and get things done um, together as a team. And so um, let's get to Q&A. I think we may have a few minutes for Q&A. And so I just wanted to know if there are anything that I presented that I could provide more clarity on. Um, sure. There's a question for you. Um, could you please explain the usage definition of violent in the term NDC? Uh, you know, <laughs> that is such a very good question. Uh, because the first time I ran into nonviolent uh, communication. I'm gonna like so I, I I thought about the context of it being um, people cursing or, or 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 being very aggressive to toward each other. And when you look at the aggression that sometimes we we provide in the office of screaming at each other, we're in each other's face, um, we're undermining each other. To me, that's all violence against an individual. And with nonviolent, uh, what they're talking about is about empathy and honesty. Um, how do I really understand what your needs are and why you're screaming and carrying on the, the, in that way? So I, I could really sit down and listen to that. And you know, if Denise is screaming at me, I could say, I sense that you are angry about the, the fact that my presentation um, is not engaging enough people. I mean, is, is, am I sensing correctly? And, and so you can see by framing that question in that way, it kind of diffused and it allowed Denise to know that I'm listening to her and I heard what she said and I'm acknowledging what she said. So that, that's what violence, is, that's what uh, Marshall Rosenberg is talking about. It's, it's really about empathy and how do we respond and how do we even communicate in, in a language that people could understand that we're not just totally pissed off for the sake of being pissed off. I hope that answered that, that question. Thank you. Um, here's another one. Advice on older works who are disengaged. 
older workers? Oh, yeah, I think that's what they're trying to say. Um, how do we engage older workers? Um, <laughs> it's funny, I was, I was at, at a conference and what do they call us? Vintage people. <laughs> or the vintage is what they use to. <laughs> <laughs> is that the new term? <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, she keeps saying the vintage uh, people. And I'm like, oh, I feel like <laughs> what jeans happened to clothes. seasoned? <laughs> oh, oh, vintage is much better. No, vintage is the new word. <laughs> See, season is out. Vintage is in. The way you engage older workers is, is the same as you engage um, everyone. Uh, it, it's, it should be no different. You have to give people a purpose and and, and allow them to be a part of the team. I, I know. I, I, I'll tell you this. I was working with this one team once, and and here there are seasoned people in in, in technology. Some of them have been there working in technology for 30 years. They've been at this organization for 15, working on the same product. Um, by going through this step and beginning to share with them the importance of, of retrospective, and because this was, one, that was one of the hang-ups. We're so experienced, we know everything. And I, said, I said, can I get you guys to like just for one second, um, let's just do away with disbelief. It's just really simple, that simple question. Can I ask you to just do away with disbelief for one second and just step into this moment? I know, that, and if, if you, after having this, I said, give me about three to five attempts so that you could really give me, you know, an appropriate feedback. It gives yourself an opportunity to truly understand if what we're doing makes sense, right? And so it was so important to get them to really suspend disbelief just for a moment and by asking them that question, it gave me permission to be able to engage them in different ways. Uh, and so sometimes that's all it takes. You know, just say, can, can I get you to suspend this belief for just one moment and give me a few opportunities to, to you, for you to have this experience? And then you could tell me if you don't like it or not. And if you want to opt out, that's, that's up to you. But this is how you engage uh, people who have been around for a while. And that, that's a technique that has worked for me. Uh, thank you. And we have another one last question before we go through our closing slides. Uh, does this cycle take place once a week in a one-hour meeting? Um, retrospectives normally take a sprint. A sprint normally is two weeks. And so it's the end of, of the last day of the sprint at the end of two weeks. And it's normally anywhere from 60 to 120 minutes, one hour to two hours. This is really how long it takes. I prefer 90 minutes because it gives a, an opportunity to really have a nice cadence or a nice pace of being able to, for people to set the stage. There's laughter, um, it, you know, there's frustrations. We can work through those things. So at the end of, you know, the, the 90 minutes, people walk out the room with a direction. Okay, this is the one thing we're going to focus on as a team. Right? There's nothing like focusing people on, you know, one common thing. So I, I would recommend that, um, you know, you make it the end of a sprint. And if your sprint is one week, then that's when it is, the end of that week for, you know, 60 to 120 minutes, somewhere within there. All right, Denise. Thank you. Um, you can carry on with your last slides. My last slides. I have last slide. Okay, so let's talk about knowledgeshare.org. Um, get out there, see what we're doing. Um, we have some blogging. Blog with me. Um, I like to share what's going on, as you can obviously see. I mean, it's bringing you knowledge about agile practices and techniques, lean thinking, um, to uh, the community. Um, see how we could help you at any point in time. Um, you can get our book. I have a book called Transforming Your Leadership Character, The Lean Thinking and Agility Way and also a great game called Agility Leadership. Um, it's all about collaborative learning and, and how we work together. I, I was actually in Santa Barbara last night um, running this game and talking about the book and this concept. Um, and I, I live about three hours from Santa Barbara, so I drove there one way for three hours, did a presentation for two, and drove back another three, full day. Um, I mean, get out there on Amazon.com and pick it up, and maybe a great Christmas gift coming up. 
um, you know, we encourage you guys to get out there and, and start to share your knowledge. If that's your passion about helping our future generation, we teach kids about agility and innovation and technology. So go to fivesaturdays.org. Um, you can also donate. Um, we, we're also, I mean, Project Insight is a great contributor to our program, and hence why we contribute back to, you know, these webinars as well. Um, I do a, a, a podcast as well. It's called, you can go to grokshare.com. And so you could also pick up Now Share with Dr. Dave on iTunes or Google Play. Same concept, you know, Grok Share is, is where the podcast is hosted on the web. But if you're on iTunes or, or Google Play, just connect up with Now Share with Dr. Dave. And you get to hear a lot of the same presentations that I've done here, as well as other conversations that I'm having with other industry experts, other people who are authors as well, and so you get a lot of context and information about about what's going on with me and in the community as a whole. Um, so just be out, just go out to nullshare.org, www.nullshare.org. Um, send me an email, connect with me on Twitter. Um, I'm very I'm very engaged with a lot of this information. And Denise, it's yours. Thank you very much. Um, by the way, there's a lot of kudos here for you on a great presentation. Thank you. Or should I quote, excellent. Thank you. Either which way, I'm loving it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, all right, guys. So for those of you uh, asking about the recording and the slides, those will be sent to you by tomorrow via email. So just keep an eye out um, in your inbox. And as far as your PDU, that will be automatically sent to you also via email towards the end of today. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, anything else I can help you with, I'm happy to do so. Please feel free to reach me at denise.rodriguez at projectinsight.com. And you will earn one PDU per webinar attended. To register your PDUs, log into PMI and log in as a member of PMI. Go ahead and select course or training and fill out all the information below which will also be available within your PD certificate. For those of you on social media, I'd like to invite you to follow, like, and subscribe to our social media channels. Our handle on Twitter is at Project Insight. You can also find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube for the latest MPI news. In our Project Inside community, you'll find many more uh, recorded videos and webinars for you to watch and learn from. Um, although this is our last Agile presentation, they will be starting back up in January of next year. Um, and I believe we have one more IT methodology coming up next week. We have a couple more project management trainings. Um, I believe there's one in two weeks and one in December. There's also one last leadership webinar. Um, so stay tuned, register to, um, for those of you who have not already done so. Um, and that's it. Um, we'd like to give a special thanks to Dave um, for you know great time with us, a great year. We started, I believe, in March. So yep. um, thank you so much, Dave. Um, all of this has been great information. We brought you know the Agile concepts into our webinar series um, at the beginning of this year. So. We're very happy, and we hope to bring all this back to you guys um, next year, with Dave's help, of course. <laughs> well, and with everyone's help, um, I would really like to encourage people to send me emails, uh, topics that you're curious about, that um, we could actually refocus and make sure that you are also participating in, in the process as well. So also, yes. I'd say have a great Thanksgiving, have a great um, Christmas. Uh, and really just a blessed and safe um, new year. And I look forward to uh, sharing again more with you guys and gals. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, and you and I will keep in touch. And thank you for everyone else who uh, has joined us today. And we hope to see you on board next time. Take care, guys. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.